Boss Brand Flakes present. Believe it or not. The delicious cereal that's more than a cereal bring you Robert Ripley with more of his amazing Believe It or Not, B.A. Rolfe and his orchestra, and lovely Linda Lee. Yes, sir, life is swell when you keep well. And what a really swell cereal Post 40% Brand Flakes are. A wonderful flavor, nut-like and crunchy. And then, in addition, this delicious cereal has those extra benefits. The benefits of brand, so many of you need to help you keep fit naturally. So first thing, why don't you join the millions who enjoy Post Brand Flakes every day? And here's that welcome-worthy, wonder-working winner of well-founded, warranted, worldwide wows, believe it or not, Bob Ripley. Greetings, everybody, and welcome to the program tonight. Bob Ripley, that problem you gave me last week certainly has me all mixed up. What do you mean, Linda? Remember, you asked me what war ended 30 years before it started. Oh, yes, that was a war between the Mazabites and the French in North Africa in 1880. Linda, just as the war was about to break out, the French diplomats urged them to stop and avoid useless bloodshed. But the Mazabites said that they'd never started anything unless they finished it, and they always finished every war they started. Now, in order to satisfy everybody, the French and the natives signed a paper, now in the records of the French War Ministry, stating that the war had ended 30 years before it started. Believe it or not. Bear off in the orchestra give expression to a popular preference. I love to whistle. Okay, B.A. for us to believe that only 100 years ago, the crimes of forgery and counterfeiting were punishable by death. Now, my first radio drama tonight deals with the most fantastic counterfeiting case that has ever come to my attention. The time, August the 9th, 1828. The place, the gloomy criminal court of Old Bailey in London. The defendant, John Lloyd, who is on trial for forgery and possession of counterfeit money, is whispering to his solicitor, Mr. Hunt. But, Mr. Hodges, I told him I got those banknotes honestly. Both Mr. Glover and myself realize that you're innocent, John, but we haven't got the evidence to prove it. What are you going to do? 
let me, an innocent man, go to the gallows? Easy, lad. You're not on the gallows yet. There's still a trump to be played. Mr. Glover is going to try and confuse the Crown's witness. You mean Henry Hayes? He's a wise on he is. How do you do it? We shall ask him to identify again each and every one of those counterfeit five-pound notes which they hold in evidence against you. What good's that going to do? You see, lad, the barrister realizes things look pretty black for you, and he knows you're innocent. He's done a desperate thing. What's he done? He's actually tampered with King's evidence. No. He's substituted a genuine five-pound note for one of the counterfeits. If Mr. Hayes identifies that genuine note as counterfeit, it will discredit him as an expert witness, and the case against you will collapse. Listen, Mr. Glover's about to begin cross-examination. Mr. Glover, you may proceed with the cross-examination of the Crown witness, Henry Hayes. Thank you, my lord. Now, Mr. Hayes, as cashier of the Bank of England, you have previously testified that these Bank of England notes, ten in number and a five-pound denomination, are forgeries. I refer, of course, to Exhibit A. I did so testify. Would you be obliging enough to explain how you arrived at that conclusion? You're aware, of course, that a man's life is at stake. There is no doubt in my mind that they're forgeries. You are prepared to swear again that each and every one of these banknotes in Exhibit A is a forgery? I am. Then I call upon you to restate your opinion of these banknotes under oath. I give them to you now for re-examination. I have done this already. It is ridiculous. The court wishes to instruct the witness that Mr. Glover is within his rights and insisting upon your re-examination of the notes. Very well, then. I'll take them. Let me see. The first note. Obvious forgery. Second. Likewise. Third. Likewise. Fourth. Strange. Go on, Mr. Hayes. I beg pardon, my lord. May I request that the bailiff hand me the magnifying glass in my cloak? The court so directs. Mr. Rogers, I told you it was foolish to try and trip him up. Mr. Hayes is a wise old fox. I can feel that noose tight around my neck now. I wouldn't give you tuppence for my life. Mr. Glover. Wait, listen. You may resume cross-examination of the Crown witness. Thank you, my lord. Well, Mr. Hayes, you seem perturbed. What strange mystery did your magnifying glass disclose when you examined that banknote? I... I... Mr. Glover, this note is genuine. It's very strange. Genuine, eh? I see, Mr. Hayes, the fate of my poor defendant has now suddenly begun to concern you. Can it be possible you made a mistake in your first examination? No, but, uh... My lord, with the court's permission... I would like to confer for a moment with the counsel for the Bank of England. Very well, Mr. Hayes. Our mission is granted. Look, John, we've got him on the run. You're right. He does look green about the gills. I wonder what's up. I'm ready, my lord. Court recognizes Mr. Hayes. Proceed. The Bank of England wishes to withdraw all charges preferred against the accused, John Lloyd. Order in the court. Order in the court. The court has no choice but to grant this motion. But, before it makes its rule definite, the court wishes to question the Crown witness. Mr. Henry Hayes. Yes, my lord? What has prompted this sudden reversal of attitude on your part? I'm still dazed, my lord. What has happened, I cannot yet believe. When I examined this five-pound note a moment ago... I found it to be genuine. You already testified to that effect? Yes, my lord. But there was something else. There is writing on it. Writing in blood. Did you say in blood? Yes. Written on this five-pound note is a message for help. It reads as follows. I am writing this with a splinter of wood dipped in my own blood. If this note should fall into friendly hands, let it be known that I have been languishing... In a slave galley in Algeria, in the cruel services of Hussein Pasha. Please help me. Mr. Hayes, why are you so deeply concerned about this? My lord, the man who signed the message on this banknote has been missing for 13 years. He is Samuel Hayes, my brother. <laughs> The wildest flight of fancy, 
could never contrive a situation more dramatic or more unbelievable than this. The lawyer's trick in substituting a genuine five-pound note for a counterfeit brought to light a message written in blood by the long-lost brother of the Crown witness. And so two human lives were saved by a banknote, the life of the defendant in the case, and that of the long-lost brother who was traced to the English consul in Algiers and ransomed from slavery. The note itself is now an exhibit in the Bank of England Museum in London. Believe it or not. audience, B.A. Rolfe and his orchestra play More Than Ever. Life is a song when nothing's wrong. Good. How about you, Linda? Hmm. Oh, life is a tune when there's love and a moon. <laughs> I'll take a slice of that myself, Linda. And, I Bob, <laughs> how about you? Well, how about life is bright when you start the day right? Life is bright when you start the day right. Say, Bob, I think you've got something there. And you know, folks, one mighty sensible way to start the day right is to treat yourself at breakfast to a bowl of delicious post bran flakes. The cereal, that's more than a cereal. You all know the benefits of bran. Why, it may be what you need to help keep you fit, alert, feeling in the pink. Well, post bran flakes bring you the benefits of bran in the swellest tasting cereal ever. Crunchy golden brown flakes with a wonderful, really different nut-like flavor. That's why you'll find post bran flakes on more breakfast tables than any other Bran Flake cereal, because more people like them. So when breakfast time rolls round again, just do this. Fill up a bowl with these crunchy, delicious post-Bran Flakes. 
sprinkle on some sugar and add plenty of rich milk or cream. Say, after that first spoonful of post bran flakes, I'll wager you'll agree, here's the cereal for me. Probably the most cussed and discussed subject in the world today is the weather, and we've had plenty of it lately. But we really shouldn't complain about the weather. We've had worse. Why, the year 1866 was known as a year without a summer. All along the Atlantic coast, they had snow, sleet, rain, and cold all summer long. In July, birds froze to death in the fields and forests. Crops never came up, and not a single fruit tree bore fruit all year long. But the like of it has never happened since. But the most dismal of all days within the memory of man was the famous dark day of 1790. On May the 19th, midday was as black as midnight. And it wasn't due to any eclipse of the sun at all, but was caused by a mysterious formation of heavy black clouds. Roosters failed to crow, all animals remained asleep, and people actually carried lanterns down Broadway at noontime. <laughs> we really didn't have a bad storm this week. Why, when I was in the Philippines, I came across a place where the greatest of all storms took place. This was a real flood. On July the 14th, 1911, 46 inches of rain fell in 24 hours in Baguio, not far from Manila. That means that more rain fell in Baguio in one day than usually falls in Los Angeles in three years. Twenty-six years ago, next Thursday, the greatest tragedy in the history of the sea occurred. On the night of April the 14th, 1912, a wireless message crackled across the ocean announcing that the Titanic, hailed as the safest ship afloat, was sinking. That message was received by a young Marconi operator sitting alone in his little wireless station in New York City. This operator was the first to receive and to send out this disastrous message to the world, the sinking of the Titanic with a loss of 1,518 lives. President Taft in Washington even ordered all wireless stations silence so this boy could continue receiving messages from the rescue ship. And he performed this heroic task. He stayed at his wireless key for 72 hours at a stretch without relief. This coming week, being the anniversary of the Titanic disaster, I think it's fitting to pay tribute to this boy of 26 years ago. That wireless operator was none other than David Sarnoff, now President of the Radio Corporation of America and Chairman of the Board of the National Broadcasting Company, believe it or not. <laughs> For my next Believe It or Not, I take you back over 40 years to 1896 in Port Hope, Michigan. It's just before dinner at the home of the Shoebring. The children are playing an exciting game of bear and Indian when the mother calls to them. <laughs> children! Children! Dinner will be ready in a second, just as soon as I get this bread cut. All right, Mother. We're on a bear hunt. We're out in the woods and we're Indians. <laughs> Yippee, look out, Mr. Bear! <laughs> Here we come! Children! How can I cut bread with you under my feet? Come out from under that table, Arthur. That isn't a table, Mother. That's a big cave. And it isn't Arthur. He's a bear. Oh, Yippee! Look out, Mr. Bear. Here we come. Look out, Arthur! <laughs> oh, my darling. What have I done? What's the matter, Mother? What's the matter with Arthur? He jumped out from under the table, and this red knife went right into his eye. <laughs> And that little boy who was playing a game with his brother and sister that evening is here with us tonight to tell us the strange conclusion to that accident. Mr. Arthur Shubring, I can't think of anything more terrifying than a bread knife going into an eye. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. What, a knife in your eye? Yes, Mr. Ripley. You see, before my accident, I was so cross-eyed that I was very miserable. The bread knife must have cut a muscle, and it straightened out my eyes. Now my eyes are perfectly normal. Yes, that's right. Your eyes are. They're not cross-eyed anymore, I'm sure. Thank you, Mr. Shubring. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I think you'll agree that that was a lucky accident. Arthur Shoebring, who was cross-eyed when a little boy, accidentally ran into a bread knife his mother was holding, and that accident straightened out his crossed eyes. Believe it or not. on the subject of lucky accidents, I have a young man standing here beside me whom I'd like to question. His name is Robert Merrill. He came here from Crane, Missouri. Mr. Merrill, uh, tell us, where were you on October the 16th, 1931? I was out hunting with a rifle. And what happened? As I was running across the field, I tripped and fell. The gun went off and the bullet went right through my side. That's terrible. Oh, no, Mr. Ripley, that bullet did me a favor. A <laughs> favor? Yes. When I got to the hospital, the doctors told me that the bullet had clipped off my appendix clean as a whistle. Well, <laughs> that was a lucky bullet, I must say. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard from Robert Merrill, who was out hunting and stumbled and fell while carrying a rifle. The rifle went off and the bullet went completely through his right side. But instead of hurting him, the bullet miraculously cut off his appendix with surgical precision... Believe it or not. <laughs> this uh, being the night of lucky accidents, I have also invited Mr. Joe Fleischman from Jackson, Michigan, to come here and tell us about his accident. Now, tell us what happened to you, Mr. Fleischman. I was smoking a pipe, Mr. Ripley. Well, that's good. No, that was bad. <laughs> because I was fixing a tire at the same time. Oh, and that was bad. No, that was good. Because the tire exploded in my face. Well, what's good about that? When the tire exploded in my face, it drove the pipe stem right down my throat. Oh, I, I suppose that was just dandy. It was. You see, I had some trouble with my tonsils. Good or bad? <laughs> Don't worry. It all ended happily, Mr. Ripley. The tire exploded in my face and drove the pipe stem down my throat. And that pipe stem cut off my tonsils completely and free of charge. Free of charge? <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard of three lucky, believe it or not, accidents with a purpose. You've heard Arthur Shoebring, who got a knife in the eye and straightened out his cross eyes. Robert Merrill, who tripped over a rifle, which went off, the bullet removing his appendix. Joe Fleischman, who had a pipe stem driven down his throat, which removed his tonsil. Proving that the worst that can happen to you is for the best. Or truth is stranger than fiction. Believe it or not. <laughs> Lovely Linda Lee now sings for our post Grand Flakes audience in the shade of the new apple tree. Underneath the shady apple tree You recall a picture dear to me Your dress is another But your smile is still your mother In the shade of the new apple tree Bob your hair and show your knees. Though the world is new and fancy free, the old moon's above you, and the words are still I love you in the shade of the new apple tree. Gone are all the bonnets and shawls that set one heart aflame. Gone are the hoops and the bottles and the skirts, but a kiss is still the same. Fortunately, there'll always be you and me in the shade of the new apple tree. A lot of leaves have fallen, a lot of grass has grown. In that apple orchard, your granny once had known. Drink your new Manhattan, light your cigarette. Fly through the sky, but no matter how you try to change your nature, yeah. 
mighty rosy old world when you're feeling tops. Yes, life is swell when you keep well. So why not keep on feeling that way? And here's a good recipe. Plenty of fresh air and sunshine. The right kind of exercise. Get sleep enough. And enjoy the right food. At breakfast, enjoy the cereal that's more than a cereal. The cereal that brings you a marvelous flavor and the benefits of bran. Post bran flakes. And here's another recipe. I wonder how many of you know just how good bran muffins can be. Well, you'll find a recipe on your package of Post Bran Flakes that'll make just the finest bran muffins you ever put in your mouth. Moist, tender, full of flavor. And you'll find bran muffins a splendid way for you to vary your use of Post Bran Flakes. So ask your grocer for Post Bran Flakes. Join the millions of folks who get off each day to a sensible start with Post Bran Flakes. Yes, sir. Life is swell when you keep well. Bob, what's yeah. the big question tonight? Well, Linda, tonight, uh, here's the question. Now, tell me, in what country are animals obliged to wear veils? <laughs> I know that veils are all the rage this spring, but I didn't know that our four-footed friends wore them. Well, there is a country where the animals wear veils, Linda. And if you don't find out by next Saturday, veil, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow is Palm Sunday. It commemorates the entry of our Lord into Jerusalem 1,908 years ago. He was acclaimed by the multitude who took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him. And now, I would like to repeat to you the hosanna of the throng that awaited him before the gate. It is Psalm 118, verse 25, and it's a timely invocation. Save us now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. This is Ford Bond saying good night and keep fit for the makers of Post Brand Blake. Music from the productions Mad About Music, Radio City Revels, and Hooray for What were used on this program. This is the National Broadcasting Company.